convening the Rotary Club of Louisville. I'm Barry Barker, president of the club. Uh, we had uh, a note passed along by a Rotarian, uh, and I thought it was uh, useful to um, just draw, draw a line in history, draw a connection in history. The, uh, the Lieutenant Richard Cole uh, passed this week at the age of 103, uh, and he was the last living member Little Raiders. So now you can all go to your Google and get the history on all of that. But just an incredible, if you think about that event and changing around the spirit of the country that was, uh, was worried for Martin. All right. The leaders in our invocation. <laughs> He is a former director of our club, a 1912 society member, and a Paul Harris fellow. Now, last week with Kevin Wardell, who was one of the founders of the 1912, I pointed out he had not been a Rotarian for 100 years. Uh, in this case, Max put him. <laughs> We've heard recently of the occurrence of some wooden giants in Bernheim Forest. Well, Mac has been one of Bernheim's giants for many years in distinguished service, support, and leadership of their natural gem. of the Burnham Holdings and build industrial or residential properties that would degrade or destroy large sections of Burnham. <clears throat> the plan was to acquire 39 separate parcels of land to make Burnham one whole single tract of property. When I left, after 24 years, we had acquired 37 of the 39. A year later, they acquired number 38. The money was in the bank to do it. It was just a question of the agreement had been signed, and it was accomplished. And then I guess a couple of years ago, Mark invited him to uh, celebrate the purchase of the Raymond Thurman track in 2017. I checked off number 39, and it had only been 44 years. <laughs> Mark is and has been the perfect steward for Mr. Bernheim's legacy, a living gift to the future generations to enjoy and learn from. I left the solid core of Bernheim property for Mark to take and continue for to add more acreage through purchases and partnerships and easements to ensure the future as a viable facility. He continues to creatively educate the public and Mr. to become a cadre of supporters to perpetuate Mr. Bernheim's gift to the people of Kentucky in perpetuity, connecting people and nature. The long-range planning horizon is tough to understand, but 
snake and a white oak seedling have burned down today, it will take between 140 and 160 years for it to be eligible to become a barrel snake. <laughs> Mark. <laughs> because we have a complex place. We now have 16,137 acres. That's 25.5 square miles. And so what I'd like to do today is run you through some of the official things we do, run you through some of the beauty at Bernheim, run you through some of the fun things we do, and hopefully tie it all together so that you get that what we've been trying to do for 90 years and what we want to do for the next 900 years is connect people with nature so that everyone benefits. It all started with Isaac Wolf Bernheim. He came to the United States, the German Jewish immigrant, at the age of 19 with four dollars in his pocket. And he made his way down from New England to Paducah, Kentucky, where he met up with his brother. And from there, they decided that they were going to buy a horse and wagon, and they were going to transport bourbon barrels, whiskey barrels. Well, it didn't take them long to figure out that the real money is in filling those barrels. <laughs> and so they bought an old decrepit distillery right up here. And by the way, I'm not going to pretend to tell bourbon history in Kentucky. Uh, there, there are those who are much better at it than I. So I'm giving you the abridged version. But they bought an old distillery, and they started the Bernheim Brothers Distillery. Distillery. They produced the I.W. Harper brand of bourbon. And I.W. from Isaac Wolf Bernheim. Uh, but he didn't feel that a German Jewish name would sell at the time. So they grabbed the name Harper as a good American name. And so I.W. Harper became one of the first bourbons that was broadly sold outside of Kentucky. It became one of the best sellers in parts of Asia for decades. And in fact, has now only been brought back to the United States just a few years ago, and it's now owned by Diageo. So unfortunately, we don't get a dime when they sell out of the uh, but, but at the age of 65, Mr. Bernheim wanted to show the people of Kentucky his thanks because it's the people of Kentucky that allowed him, a German Jewish immigrant with nothing in his pocket, to make it big, to live the American dream. And so at age of 65, he bought 13,000 acres way outside of Louisville, way down there in Bullock, Nelson County. And he bought 13,000 acres that were overgrazed, overmined, uh, o o uh, logged. It was just decrepit land. But he knew that nature was restored. And so he purchased this land and he began to plan. And in fact, he used the Olmsted brothers to help design the heart of Bernheim. So that's kind of fun when we have the Olmsted National Conference here coming up next week. Um, so what did he want? He wanted all people, regardless of race, creed, or economic status, to benefit from nature because he knew nature was restored, not only of itself, but for people as well. So today, we follow that, that vision. We connect people with nature in many, many ways. We wear many hats. We have outdoor education programs. We have art programs. 
We have uh, forest research and ecological research going on. We have horticulture and wonderful plant collections and so much more. So let's run through some of that and see what, what we're doing. One of the things about Bernheim is we love trees. We have a 600 acre arboretum. An arboretum, by the way, is literally means a place for trees. So whether it's a big oak specimen that's so beautiful, or whether it's a pecan tree in all four seasons, or whether it's walking through our American and European beach collection in the spring, it's all the same. It's about nature and the beauty of trees and what, what nature has provided. But what makes Bernheim truly unique is that we have 16,137 acres. We have forests, and forests are what everyone needs. Big blocks of forest, unbroken by humans, is what everybody needs. Because forests protect clean air, they provide clean water, and water is life. And you know, water is also bourbon. That limestone filtered water is the basic ingredient of bourbon. And so we are protecting 13 headwater streams. And in fact, we just recently announced that we have the Jim Beam Natural Water Sanctuary Alliance at Bernheim. And the idea is that Beam is going to help us expand our education about the importance of water and what you can do to protect water that's coming off your own yard and backyard and how you can use water responsibly. So we're very proud of the fact that we're protecting water regions. And water, of course, also provides wonderful biology, wonderful life. And here's a picture of an otter, a river otter, that was captured at Bernheim on a trail camera, I mean. Um, and we have so much more. And whether it's direct or indirect, water is important to everything. Whether it's these monarch butterflies on the atras, um, you know, it's still a matter of having fresh, clean water in this beautiful habitat. Bernheim, by the way, is working with many other organizations and is part of a statewide plan <coughs> to build habitat, protect habitat for monarchs and other pollinators. So we're very proud of that outreach activity as well. Oh, there it is. Yikes. Um, we can't do this alone. And so we have these wonderful mythic creatures at Bernheim. These are forest giants in the giant forest. And this is Mama Lamar. She is a troll. And as a troll, you know, they can be a little bit mischievous, but they also are protectors of land, water, and forest. And so Mama Lumari is standing there, you know, laying there, and enjoying our forest while her two children are off playing. I don't know if you can tell it or not, but there is a human being in, in that picture, uh, sort of where Mama is in the back, in the shadows, about the size of Mama's foot. And, and it's, it's uh, standing sort of where her belly comes down. By the way, there's a rumor she might be pregnant. <laughs> so what's Bernheim's vision? We want to be a nationally treasured leader in ecological stewardship that inspires the exploration of our deep connection with nature. Now, I could, spend, I could spend three hours on that alone, but I won't. Let's just say that what we're trying to do is bigger than Bernheim, it's bigger than this region. It is about protecting the Earth itself. And we're doing that by connecting people with nature in all kinds of fun ways. And one of the ways we do that is we try to change perspectives. We try to give you different views of nature. And we do that if you've ever been out on the canopy tree walk. Who's been out on the canopy tree walk? Oh, great, yeah, quite a few of you. By the time you're coming off the knob, by the way, those, those hills or small mountains, in Kentucky are called knobs, which took me a lot to understand. But um, by the time you come off that, that knob and you're on the edge of that canopy tree walk, you're 75 feet above the forest floor. It's really a wonderful vista, one of the, one of the many valleys we control. We use art in nature also to change your perspective. And here's a piece by a local artist, Matt Weir, and it was done um, in honor of Barry Bingham Jr., who was on our board for many years and was so important to this entire community. And I'll give you one hint. If you ever come and visit, when you come and visit, you need to talk to this culture. It'll talk back. 
and we've had artists in residence for over 39 years now. And next year, we're celebrating our 40th anniversary of our artists in residence. And we've had artists from all over the world. And they come in, and sometimes they do very ephemeral art. We've had artists work with leaves. And you know how long a leaf lands, uh, lasts outside? Not very long. But we capture that imagery. We've had artists do paintings. We've had artists do physical sculptures. And it's so much fun because artists look at the world differently than I do as a scientist. And what they do is they allow our visitors to look at the world differently as well. So next year for our 40th anniversary, we've got some wonderful things planned. And we had Patrick Doherty come and do Snake Hollow. This was a willow sculpture that was so big it was like a maze. And, and it lasted two years. And then we mulched it and used it in the plant bed. So that's the way life and art works at Bernheim. But you know, it's, it, it can be a lot of fun. Here's um, an artist that we brought in, uh, Ashley Peaver from Britain came in. And he worked with a group of Smoketown kids. And they planted these living costumes. These are grass and other plants that are then sewn into this costume. And our staff who wore these said it was a little bit like being buried alive. Um, but but they, they made their way through our Connect event, where we have art, science, nature going on around our lake. And the crowds just love it. These are like you know, grassy, abominable snowmen or something. And of course, we do nature-based education. And we're very proud of the fact that we have over 10,000 students coming through Bernheim. And we have very many more in home schools and unofficial groups that come through as well. And so we literally try to immerse these students in nature. And here they're at Wilson Creek, where it's one of the cleanest streams in Kentucky because we restored it. And they're catching crawdads and snakes and all kinds of good stuff. And of course, we take them into places where many kids wouldn't go by themselves. And so we're telling stories about the plants and the animals they're seeing, and about how they can be heroes. And we work beyond our borders. Pollinators 
And boy, once you've been on a green roof, you've got to wonder why every roof isn't green. It's just blue. But we steward this land, the 16,000 acres. We take care of it. One of the more dramatic ways is through prescribed fire. And you know what that does? It, it clears out the woody materials and there's a big field, and that allows the forest, grasses and, and flowers to come back. Um, if it's a fire in the forest, it can take care of some of the softer wood trees, like beeches and maples. And so we do prescribed forest fires as well. By the way, I get nervous every time we do one of those. But, you know, we, we create this wonderful habitat, and in many cases, birds and butterflies and other creatures come back naturally. But in this case, we helped introduce, reintroduce, Bob White whale to the Bernheim area. They have died off 25, 30 years ago for a number of reasons. And now they're back singing in the spring, and many of our neighbors have said, I've got a covey on my farm. I haven't seen those in 30 years. So it's a wonderful thing when you can restore nature. And we do it at some grand scale. At the top, you have Wilson Creek. And this is a, a valley where the farmers moved the streams that used to meander down the middle to one side of the valley so that they could farm the whole thing. Well, you know what that does? It speeds up the water, it causes erosion, does all kinds of bad things. So we brought, brought it back into a meander that tied it into the water table. It slowed the water, getting rid of silt. It allowed pools to occur. It allowed natural vegetation to come back. And there at the bottom, you can see just five years later how beautiful that is. And of course, we had the help of beavers. The world's best engineers came and helped us create this wetland. And we just love it, and we still love it today, and it continues to grow. And we're about to restore another stream as well. So we'll have two streams, about 15 or 18 years apart in age, that are right next to each other, and we'll be able to walk from one to the other. There's no other natural classroom for stream restoration like that in the United States. And we work with wonderful species, my favorite, bats. Everybody, who, who loves bats? Raise your hand. Okay, all right, all right. Hey, those who didn't, you will. And, and one, of the, one of the things is, Kentucky has 14 bat species. We have 13 of those species at Bernheim. So it's really incredible habitat. And you know, here's one of my favorites. This is Rapinesse's big-eared bat. You know, look at those ears. This bat doesn't pick very many insects out of the air. What it does is it goes up and down leaves on trees and up and down cliffs, and it gleams those insects off of the side of those leaves. And, oh, isn't that a face only a mother could love? <laughs> but we work with some other important species as well. Who has been following the story of Harper and Athena, our golden eagles that we've been tracking? Oh, I love it. Uh, okay, I'm about to get a bunch of converts. I love it. Um, so, golden eagles are pretty rare in these. Whew, that's my timer. Excuse me. I can talk forever. <laughs> golden eagles are rare in the East United States. We've trapped two of them, put these solar power trackers on them, and now we're following them on their migratory routes back up to Canada where they breed up near the Hudson Bay. Um, Harper's track is on in the blue, uh, Athena's track is on the red. This is when they left uh, Bernheim in March. That's up near um, Indianapolis and, and Terre Haute. Uh, then a few weeks later, they checked in again. Every time they go near a cell tower, they give us data. And the two are separating in their ways. Now, this is a love story in the making. We don't know whether these two eagles that hung out at Bernheim all winter are going to come back to breeding grounds together. We shall see. Nobody has ever tracked a pair of eagles out in the eastern United States. So hopefully they will prove to be a true pair. Oh, OK, there's Elena. Elena's the daughter. And Elena's playing with stone. And when you go, you'll see that she's drawing out the outline of an eagle feather on the ground. And of course, what do kids do? They hop from stone to stone to stone. So they're interacting with Elena, the daughter. We have many big ideas at Bernheim, 
and we're very proud of the fact that we have uh, big strategies. And as we move forward, we're going to continue with those strategies. And I'll give you one little piece of how we think about things. This is a conception of a new 10-acre play area. Play is important for children. It teaches them risk. It, 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 it improves their immune system. It allows them to fix and find and break rules. It gets them school ready. It does all kinds of wonderful things psychologically and socially for kids to play naturally outside. So in the way Bernheim thinks, we're going from the yellow, which is typical STEAM kind of education activities, and we're providing areas where as you progress to the right, it becomes more and more natural, more and more forest-like, more and more wild. And in that, we will be hitting a lot of important development points that every child needs. That's the way Bernheim's looking at the future. How can we systematically approach big problems? So here's Little Miss. This is the sun. And let me stop here for a minute and tell you, Thomas Gambo came from Denmark with a team of eight to build these giants for us. And it took 200 volunteers working with him for six weeks to build all three of them. And we're very proud of the fact that now we're being swamped. A typical, a typical um, April for Bernheim is 30 to 32,000 people for the entire month. First seven days of this April, first seven days during spring break, we had 48,000 people at Bernheim. So Little Miss is doing more for us than can be imagined, because we use all of that in our mission of connecting people with nature. And what we want people to think is the same thing Little Miss is. Look at your reflection in the mirror and say, how can I, how can I be a protector of nature? How can I be a forest giant and protect water, air, and wildlife? And if we get everybody to stop and think about that, then we've been successful in connecting with this nation. Thank you very much. Hi, Mark. Uh, John Walls, at Global Zoo. Uh, first, thank you for your excellent presentation and your stewardship and vision for Thank you. That's been fantastic to have you have very much. So I, I love how you close that reflection. Um, and of course, we're facing a lot of challenges in our environment right now. Amphibians are in crisis. We're facing the sixth planetary extinction with the loss of broad species. In Jefferson County alone, we've lost tens of thousands of ash trees in the lab for, for over. So my question to you um, is, what can each of us do in our backyard habitats, in our communities, Beyond, as soon as we leave here, we should all go on our phones and buy Bernheim memberships. Yes. <laughs> uh, well, I could say that. You can. <laughs> but, but what can we all do to be better planetary stewards and help you with that incredible mission that you have? Well, thank you, John, for that question. Appreciate what you do at the zoo as well. Um, you know, there, there are more, there's more area in lawns in the United States than there is in all of the national parks combined. That's pretty, uh, uh, un, uh, you know, interesting number. So that means that if we stop or reduce the spraying, poisoning, herbicides, pesticides, fertilizers on our lawns, we're suddenly going to have healthier lawns and healthier people, healthier water, healthier air. If you go and plant up a new area, you don't have to use everything native, but you know, throw 10% of things in there that are native. And suddenly you'll find you have more pollinators, you'll have more butterflies, you'll have more birds coming in. There are simple steps. By the way, there are millions of dogs and cats in the United States. Pick up after your dog. All of that waste goes right down into the water system. So that's really important. And cats should never be outdoors. Cats are predators, no matter what you think of them, and they will kill just about anything they conceive. 
So please, there's easy ways that you can make a big difference in your home and your, and your yard. Mark uh, Ken Grossman, thank you very much for your uplifting presentation. I, I've got two questions. The first one, um, do you ever have a bad day? <laughs> I thought Craig Sherman had it figured out, but you, you are over the top. I love that. Thank you. Uh, uh, parking uh, uh, 8,000 cars the other day was tough, but it was a beautiful day. So, that's my second question. I told you before the meeting, I uh, had a cousin in town. I almost came out there last weekend. Um, and uh, I honestly, I'm ashamed to say, I've been out to Vermont for since I was a kid. But what does that look like? What would, to come out, what, what, what's the best way to come out and experience Bernheim in a few hours? I know that there's so much to see, it would be more than that. But what, what's the best way to make to do that effectively? Well, you know, we've been at this game for 90 years, and things change every few years. We're adding, we're, we're changing things up. And so if you haven't been out for a number of years, you're not even going to recognize the place. We have beautiful landscapes. And if you're coming out on a weekend, come out early, please or come out after about 3 o'clock. That uh, 12 to 2 period is when everybody thinks they ought to arrive to avoid that traffic. But you know, during the week, it's not so bad. Come out, drive through our gates, and I guarantee your shoulders will relax. The landscape will take you away. There's 40 miles of hiking trails. It runs from half a mile long uh, 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 trails to 13 mile long trails. It's really, there's something for every picnic grounds, benches to read a book, edible garden, all kinds of great stuff. Come out and just experience for a Hi, Mark. I'm Larry Sloan, and thank you for coming today. Great presentation and a lot of enthusiasm. I'm curious about bees, uh, honeybees. Uh, it seems like they were in the news a lot, maybe two, three, four, five years ago, about how uh, they, they weren't, uh, they were getting killed off in some kind of a fungus or something, but what, what's the status and what does Bernheim do to help with that? Well, you know, it's interesting. Uh, bees are still in, in crisis. Uh, you know, these things kind of cycle in the news media, unfortunately, but that doesn't mean the, the, the problem goes away. And so bees are still having problems in many parts of the country, and we haven't figured out how to truly take care of all beehives to get rid of the fungus and some other problems they're having. Climate change, by the way, is one of those things that will aggravate these kinds of problems because of excessive heat, excessive water, excessive whatever. It's going to get worse, not easier. But uh, bees also, uh, the, the honeybee is a European bee. There are lots of native bees. And so one of the things Bernheim is doing is trying to enhance populations of native species. And we're doing that by improving habitat. We're doing that by understanding and surveying what bees we have and figuring out where they live. And you know, there's a lot of apias, apiaria, is that the word? Um, I'm trying to remember. Um, uh, who are, are trying to look at native bees and could they help replace some of the European bees that are having troubles around the country. <laughs> So uh, the, the, the judge, the jury is still out on that one, but there's lots of hope. As long as we're all caring and understanding, success can happen. Thank you all. Thank you for